from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. Thank you for downloading the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. This is episode 237. Physical structures, find structure, find fish. This episode is brought to you by Corkers. The Corkers brand was born 60 years ago on the treacherous banks of the Rogue River in Oregon. Their original river cleat was handmade out of rubber and spikes. The functional design quickly grew as a favorite among fishermen and the rest is history. Through the years, Corkers has continued to innovate with purpose, bringing advancements to fishing footwear, interchangeable soles, boa lacing, and internal drainage are just a few wading boot firsts brought to you by the passionate folks at Corkers. Check out their latest product line at corkers.com or with your local Corkers dealers. Corkers, helping you expand the boundaries of your outdoor adventures. My Corkers are super lightweight. And due to that drainage system, I can wear them all day and there is no fatigue. They drain quickly to allow me to walk on dry land without slogging around. You can climb into a boat, climb structure, and easily climb out of a stream when they drain. This is one of the reasons I've been wearing corkers for over a decade, and I suggest them to my clients when they need to make a purchase. Let's get on with the podcast now. And I can tell you there are rules for fish. I tell this to my clients all the time, whether we're rowing, walking, wading, or just sitting in the shade waiting for something to happen. Fish, they want to eat. They don't want to get eaten. They want to make more fish. That's the rule of fish. There's another rule of fish that I mention when we're out on the water. Rules of fish say there should be a fish there. And I'll point to something. When we come upon a physical object, that fish will congregate near. There's usually a fish in a specific spot due to a physical object. These are places I routinely bring clients to cast their lines. We call these objects structure. My job is to put people on fish and teach them why the fish are there and how they can catch those fish. We rarely fish open water. Open water may or may not have fish. And I don't have time to make that gamble when we're on the clock. We don't fish the center of lakes or ponds because the fish there are vulnerable and don't have hiding spots. We don't fish the centers of larger tidal creeks either. And apparently there are more ospreys in the D.C. metro area in the summer and spring than anywhere else in the world. I don't know if it's true, but I read that once. So we fish shorelines where more structure is going to be found and produces more opportunities to encounter fish. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this time of year, the tidal bodies are filling in with weeds, and we are limited to where we can fish. A lot of good structure has been swallowed up by SAVs. Boats are getting stuck, and it's really hard to navigate a lot of the larger bays and estuaries right now. So we've got to find alternate places to fish. Some of the tidal creeks we like to access, we can't right now because the weeds are too thick. We're going to have to wait till there's a shorter photo period in later September that we can go back into some of these spots, maybe pull out some false stripers. And I wouldn't be surprised right now if we've got redfish swimming around and a couple of blue crabs. Really hasn't rained since we had that five-inch rainstorm a couple of weeks ago. It's pretty dry outside. In fact, this is the first time in three or four summers I've had to water the garden. Got a lot of cucumbers and tomatoes this year. Not complaining, though. So this episode is applicable both the fly and conventional anglers, saltwater anglers and freshwater anglers, bait anglers and lure chuckers alike. All anglers need to understand structure and its potential to hold fish. Some of this may seem obvious to you, but there's a lot of novice anglers out there that are listening to this, trying to better understand how and where to fish. This is going to be a key episode for those anglers. Some of you might already know this, but it's a good refresher course. Structure is like a security blanket for fish. It's their comfort zone, their wooby, a safe place to hang out around for multiple reasons. When fishing, you need to find these places because that's where the fish will be. They are all there for multiple reasons. 
A lot of times they're there just for protection from predators. Places where birds, fish, otters, snakes, and other toothy critters can't access them. They may be there for resting. Nocturnal fish may be hanging out in a specific spot to just rest during the daytime while they can hunt at night. They may be there for an ambush point, somewhere where you can dart out and grab a morsel of food as it swims by or grab a fish that's unsuspecting. I speak of a lot of fish that are like the bad guys in an alleyway, hiding in that dark shadow, waiting for you to go by and they're going to snatch your purse. They may be there for a current break. If they're on the inside of the seam, the water's slower than on the outside of the seam. They may be in front of an object because the current may be weaker there. Fish may be in a specific spot because the structure is causing oxygenation of that water. It might be easier for them to breathe, especially now in the summer when hot water holds less oxygen. A fish may be in a specific location for the metabolic ease in that holding position. They can burn fewer calories sitting in a specific speed, angle, or type of water than if they were in open, fast water. And you're going to have to compare open water in a stream, which is moving, or to water in a lake, pond, or out in the open where there are currents from tides or wind pushing things around. And the water's not just going uphill to downhill. Fish might just be hanging out with friends, safety in numbers. Small fish do that all the time. Fish may be in a specific spot for shade. They may be there for warmth in the wintertime. Dark structures will absorb solar energy in the winter and allow fish to warm up. Remember, they're poikilotherms. These organisms are the same temperature as their surroundings. So if they're too hot, because the water's hot, remember the water reached 94 degrees a couple weeks ago. They're calling the Potomac bathtub hot right now. These fish can't breathe. So they may be going to find cooler water in the summertime to cool their body and blood down. And conversely, in the winter, they may be looking for shallow water, which will warm up faster, or a dark substrate, or an object that may attract more solar heat. My ichthyology and zoology professor in college, Dr. Wheeland, went out with us one day to catch snakes, and he found a black tarp on the ground and immediately said there'd be a snake on that because snakes, like fish, can only regulate their temperature based on their surroundings. And something that's black is going to attract more heat. And sure enough, he found a snake on it and grabbed it. And I mentioned this earlier in a podcast years ago. He grabbed the snake by the tail and threw it between his legs so the head was sticking out three feet behind his bum. And then he slowly pulled the snake. And once the head was between his legs, he grabbed it. That's the way I grabbed the needlefish that we unfortunately might catch on the river. Haven't seen any big needlefish this year, only juveniles. You might also fish... You might also find fish in a specific location due to a temperature gradient. Is there a cold water seep from springs coming in? Is there a thermocline where at a certain depth of water, the water's going to change temperatures? Fish may be hanging out there due to that physical chemical barrier, but there might also be structure along that that they could be hanging out along. So these are the places where bait fish or other food items might be attracted or congregated. You're going to find more caddisflies along rocks and riffles. You're going to find crayfish in all sorts of water, but bait fish are always going to be hiding in that little piece of slack water. So places where these fish might congregate for the same reasons that big fish are there. Little fish will be there to eat the little organisms. Big fish will be there to eat the little organisms and the big organisms. And as an angler, you need to coax the fish out of that structure and entice it with your fly or flies. And before you make your cast, you need to think about the following. How big is the structure? Is it big enough to change the current to make an area where bait fish can be schooled up or cause a foam line or foam scum to form? How does the water move or go around an object? Is the object redirecting the current? What is the texture of the object? Something like concrete is going to have a faster grating against it where rubble and things that have sticking out protruding nubs and bumps on it is going to slow down the current. Is the object smooth or bumpy? Is it long and smooth like a long concrete wall or a basin or some kind of man-made sluice? Like the LA River is going to be faster where it's made out of concrete. Think about Terminator and 
Greece and all the other movies and videos that are filmed there. That water is going to be faster than water that's going to have bumps and knobs along it. So does that object redirect current? And if so, how? How can you manipulate that current to get your fly in or around that piece of object? And I'm going to list all these structures coming up. But how can you manipulate your fly to get where you need it to go based on redirecting currents with possible slack water below it and faster water to the sides? So does that object increase or decrease the velocity of the water? You're going to have to work on mending, stripping, swinging. How are you going to use the tip of your rod and the fly line to manipulate your fly and the leader to get there with it looking as natural as possible? These fish are grabbing specific things that go by them and they see it all the time. Your fly has to look like a caddis fly swimming by or a mayfly caught in the current or an unsuspecting minnow, or a large bug landing on the surface with a big splat. And where does water go as it approaches the structure? You need to think about your fly. Is it going to go swirl around in an eddy? Is it going to get sucked under? There are a lot of variables to how that water is being redirected and how you can manipulate, again, your flies. Does the object break up the current? Does the object create an area of slack water in front or behind? We all talk about that bubble in front of rocks that hold fish. There are areas to the side and behind it. And when you're on a drift boat and you're on the casting platform, you get a bird's eye view of this in crystal clear water, which is one of the things we've been able to enjoy with the lack of rain. I'm hoping tomorrow that we're going snakehead hunting in absolutely pristine crystal clear water. There's a 50% chance of rain tonight. I need it for the garden, but I would also really like the next two days to have crystal clear sight casting specifically along the structure that we've been fishing all summer, and I know fish will be there. I can row from one side of the shore to the other and tack back and forth, accessing a stump on one side or something on the other. And how are you going to get your fly to that fish without spooking them? You need to do the fewest amount of casts possible. So when you're casting its structure, there's a lot of things you need to think about. Mainly, fewest casts possible. You don't want your line going over them. You don't want your false cast hitting the water and scaring them. We had some very skinny water the other day. An every fly that landed spooked the fish in every direction like cockroaches when you turn a light on. They were not into it. And that hole was about three feet deep a week or two ago and was ankle deep the other day. We're losing water here. It's pretty rare. How are you going to manipulate your fly with changing microcurrents? Lots of objects in the water are going to break up the currents more than if there's one large object displacing water. Are there potential snags when you're throwing your fly in there? Are you throwing a dry, dry rig, a single fly dry rig, a dry dropper rig with a wet fly below it, or two wet flies? You're going to have to think about these things. I would fish your main fly, say my bacon fly, to that location and then I would use a worm or a damsel or a pheasant tail or hair's ear behind that to nymph through that spot where the structure is. If they're not going to eat that big streamer coming out of their hiding spot, then maybe they might just pick off something that's a little bit easier that you can bounce around in front of their face. You have to avoid places where fish can break you off. Are you fishing over sharp structure where a fish can go across that with the fly in its mouth and abrade your leader. Is your leader strong enough? Have you checked the integrity of your leader since you last caught a fish? Places where the fish will swim in and break you off. Can you pull your fish out of there in time? If you're a guide like me, sometimes you've got to row the boat in the opposite direction to pull the fish out of there. Do you have to sneak up on them without them detecting you? And how are you going to do that? Are you on foot and you're going to creep low and slow and get that one cast in there? Are you in a boat and you have to try not to make a wake? Or if you're like Drew Chacon, you've got your paddleboard and you can sneak up on them. What if you're waiting? If you're waiting from downstream, the fish are looking upstream, so you can drop a fly in front of them. But if you're upstream from them, you might be kicking debris down and clouding up the water. Or your boots might be making too much noise, or you're just waiting too loud, or they can see you. Is the sun in their eyes? Take advantage of that. Don't cast your shadow over them. You need to be stealthy to creep up on these fish from structure because once you spook them, they might not come back there for a while. As my professor Whelan once said, 
that frog is going to stay underwater longer than you're willing to wait around for it to come up to catch it. Will that structure be viable at different tides or at different river flows? You might have something that's completely submerged at a high tide or at, say, 3,500 CFS. But at low tide, it's dry and there's nowhere for fish to hide. Or if the river drops to 800 CFS, now you're probably standing between the water and that object that you were fishing. Are the fish holding there or are they on the move? Are they moving from one spot to the next? You can watch fish go from one thing and swim upstream and hang out there and then dash to the side and go to another spot or maybe up here to another or over here. Are they on the hold sticking there or is it like a steelhead that's migrating upriver? Again, are you fishing that tandem rig? How are you going to manipulate your line to get their second fly to sweep through there without getting sucked away or pushed away or hung up on a snag? And everyone should know how to roll cast if you've caught a snag. Let's say you caught something that's 30 feet away from you. So you got 30 feet of line out. You need to strip out 7 or 8 feet of line. Slowly lift your rod. Tip it behind your head. Form your D-loop. Get your anchor on that water or on your boat. And pop a big roll cast so your line and leader go past the fly. And as soon as it goes past, you pop your rod tip up. That hook should have come loose in the opposite direction in which it was going, and now you can throw it behind you. That is one of the favorite things I will teach clients on the water, that we're not going to walk in there and ruin a hole because you're snagged on structure. We're going to roll cast past it, pop it off, or we're going to break it off and retrieve it after we fish that structure because there might be something hiding in there that is not worth us screwing it up for. Is your structure human-made or is it natural? I don't want to say man-made because my wife would get pissed at me. And is it intentional or accidental? Did a Trout Unlimited chapter come in and create that structure? Did they bolt things down to the shoreline or in the water and bury it? Did kids come in there and screw around and just try to make stuff in the stream with cinder blocks and logs? I know when I was a kid, I spent a lot of afternoons in the backyard in that creek just changing stream flow with sticks and rocks and capturing things and whatever. And I give the case that when I worked at the lodge at Harper's Ferry that burnt down, and if you want to Google the article, it's Amidst the Embers on the Washington Post from June 19th of 2003. We put in brook trout in a structureless stream. We couldn't find any of them. So I started taking rocks and making piles of them. And within minutes of me standing in that water, putting rocks together to break up the current and form structure, brook trout appeared. You'll notice this when you're wading in the rivers too. Your structure sometimes. You might have fish catching their breath downstream from your shins before they move upstream. You'll see this when you're fishing for shad on the Rappahannock. The herring will often congregate around your legs. So is it a human-made structure? And is it possibly remediation work for stream bank restoration? Did a company come in with bulldozers and cranes and drop giant jersey wall chunks and concrete there to stabilize a wall from erosion or prevent erosion in the future from around a bridge or a bend in the river or anything else that may have to deflect water by putting structure in? Fish will hang out there. Is there work done to prevent erosion or from sand moving along the beach? Think about jetties. The reason they're there is because the current on the East Coast goes up the stream, upstream. So it's going from Florida to New York. And on the California side, I believe it goes from Seattle to San Diego. So all that sand on the East Coast is going to go upstream based on the angle of the waves coming in. And all those beaches that want to attract people have to keep dumping sand in. Well, it moves away. There are people that steal sand and deposit it. And it's, it's crazy. We're also running out of sand, if you haven't read that article. I don't remember where that was posted, but we're running out of sand. So people will put jetties and structures in there for the stabilization of the sand. And that's going to attract fish. I may be at the Jersey Shore next weekend watching kids throwing lures in there. But I've never seen anyone catch anything, so I don't bring my gear. And was it something sunk in the water to attract fish? There are purposely man-made, human-made reefs that people will sink to attract 
scuba divers, which attract fish, or attract fish to attract scuba divers, or to attract coral to grow on something, or whatever. People drop things in the water intentionally to attract fish. Natural structure could be anything that ends up in the water that was not done by you or me. And I'm going to go over my list of things. And there's things you probably have fished, have thought about fishing, would never fish or want to fish, or maybe on your bucket list. So I sat down and came up with the list of things that you will find fish around based on my observations in all my years of guiding and pleasure fishing and watching other people fish. Beaver dams, my goodness. Beaver dam might be one of the greatest fish structures of all time. It's got lots of sticks and vegetation, nooks and crannies for all sorts of critters to hang out inside and on top of that will fall in the water or are already in the water that fish can eat. There are things sticking out at odd angles, making all sorts of structures. I've got one stick in my aquarium here, and I got it resting on two mussel shells. And underneath it, there's a, a little, little sunfish that will hang out right in that spot because there's an awkward stick hanging out that's his structure spot. One thing about beaver dams is they often have water snakes on them. So when you snag and you try to pop your fly off with that roll cast and it doesn't work and you've got to go get it, I would make some noise because those are snake-loving structures. Snakes love them because they stick out of the water, they're dry, and they can sun themselves. Beaver dams. Now, beaver lodges, whether intact or not, are another phenomenal structure. When I was a kid, I used to walk across the beaver lodges and fish either downstream from them in the fast water or upstream in the pond. And I would always see huge copperheads. I've not seen a wild copperhead since 1996 in April when I went down to Chain Bridge for my first shad fishing adventure. But I used to see them on beaver dams all the time. And they would scare me to death. I would usually spook them, but I always make extra noise when I'm around Lots of wood. If you ever fish below Fletcher's Cove where all that debris ends up on shore, that makes me very nervous walking. So beaver lodges will create structure, places, nooks and crannies for fish to hang out. When they break, they will be in the water. All those minute branches are going to create microcurrents all over the place with water swirling here and there and up there and down there. Fish will find those things. For protection, anytime you see a beaver dam or beaver lodge, go fish it. I spent the summer of 94 in Colorado, and I would fish after our work was done with the paleohydrology stuff. I would tie on a little elk hair caddis and go fish the beaver ponds outside Silverton every night around dusk. And those beaver ponds were chock full of non-native invasive brook trout. And below them, you'd find rainbows in the fast water. And that was an absolutely magical way to spend my summer. Was just catching brook trout after brook trout in the middle of these crystal clear little ponds. Now, bends and river are always going to hold fish. That bend is going to be cut on one side and deposited on the other. You may have fish hanging out on the sand or gravel bar on the other side, especially if they're big enough not to worry about predators. The snakeheads around here are just DGAF. They'll hang out out in the open. Nothing seems to bother them. But those bends and rivers are always going to hold fish. They're cut. They're deep. There's hiding places for the fish. The current is altered. Things get sucked downstream into that spot. It wouldn't be cut out if the current wasn't being directed into it. And as a kid, I used to fish Difficult Run in the Vienna stretch off the W No D Canal. And there's a meandering stretch through a field. And I would always pull out bluegill in those bends. And I met a guy last week who claims that he and his dad used to catch big 10 inch brook trout out of there in Fairfax County in the seventies. One of the first people I've ever met to confirm the brook trout were in there. He could have been pulling my chain, but I don't see why he'd make that up. Bends in rivers, be a, a warm water Creek or a trout stream fish congregate there. You see it illustrated in almost every edition of a fishing magazine. Boats are another great structure, and yeah, I'm going alphabetical. 
Boats provide shade. They provide protection from above. And there's always bugs flying around them. Bugs need to crawl up something to get out of the water. So you're often going to find dragonflies hanging out around pontoon boats and other boats. Now, pontoon boats are great because you can throw a fly underneath them. There's often going to be a fish. When we're fishing near boats, pontoon specifically, any kind of moored boat, we're usually fishing this time of year a popping bug and a worm dropper. And I've got new methods for keeping my worms from melting. I freeze them in ice cubes. I put them in a turvis tumbler full of ice. Or I keep them in a cooler bag with ice packs because it's been hot and these things have been melting on me. And I don't need to keep retying them and wasting material. So we have the popping bug with about 18 to 20 inches of 8-pound tippet with a purple worm. And we'll throw the popper next to the pontoon. And being that my worm flies are weighted with a little bit of wire, they're going to sink down. And when they sink down below that pontoon boat, you're often going to get a pretty big largemouth or a huge bluegill come out and eat it. So we can go from boat to boat along a shoreline and take advantage of those fish using that boat for shade and protection. And we can pull them out because we're smarter than them. Fish were smart. They'd have the internet and they'd have their own podcasts. I love fishing boats. Just got to keep your clients from hooking them and getting snagged on them because nobody wants to get caught on a boat trespassing. And that's how you ruin public water. Bridges. Every one of you has fished a bridge. Unless you live somewhere where there are no bridges. And I can't imagine that's anywhere. Everywhere I've been in the world, I've seen bridges. Bridges go over water. Bridges create a lot of shade. They create a lot of structure with the pylons and the structures that hold them up. Fish are going to congregate around those for safety in numbers. They're going to congregate downstream from them in that current break below the pylons. Other critters are going to hang out there. You're going to have birds that are going to nest underneath them or hang out underneath them. Baby birds are going to fall in. Birds might drop food in the water. Fish are going to be in the shade of that bridge. When I was recently fishing in Ohio, it was, I don't know, 96 degrees with 96% humidity on July 4th. And these kids were fishing with corn and worms under the shade of a bridge. And that's where all the little bluegills were hanging out. All the big fish, all the muskies went to deeper water. They were a couple in shallow water out in the open. And they all said, none, you know, my flies. But that shade was exactly where they were. And you'll find this conversely at night if you're fishing around lights. The big fish are going to be hanging out in the dark water while the little fish, little fish are going to be eating phytoplankton and other macro and micro invertebrates. Tom and I love fishing bridges for trout out west. We're always going to find bridges on Google Maps when we get a chance to fish. You find a bridge, you're going to find a can of worms, some bags of split shot, and litter because that's where fish are. Anytime you find litter along the river, it's usually where they're structured. Cars. Now, cars either end up in the water by accident. We were floating down the Potomac once, and we found an entire car in the middle of the river. There are also places out west where old cars are used for stream bank restoration. So there might be cars sticking in and out of the water. Those might give you some good structure. It's a little odd seeing cars out there, but if that's your best resource is old cars around your front yard, put them in the water as long as all the oil and gas and stuff has been taken out. Same thing when they sink boats. We'll get to that later. Everyone knows coral reefs hold fish. Coral reefs are the equivalent of the rainforest canopy. It's where all the life is. And when I was a kid, we had my grandparents off of Palm Beach near Mar-a-Lago, if you want to use that for a reference. We had the old highway that was washed out during a hurricane and reclaimed by the ocean. So there was these two or three lanes of A1A out in the water that had turned into coral reef. Corals and anemones and urchins, it all settled on that. So we would go out, my brother and I, and snorkel around the coral reef and look for where the fish were congregating, where the barracuda, the snapper, and anything else we'd want to fish for. And then we would go back up to shore, grab our gear, and then fish that spot. Everyone knows coral reefs hold fish. That's why people go scuba diving there. You might want to go to the coral reefs now because they're going to be gone in not too long. I'm trying to get some friends on to talk about that, but people are super busy this summer. Coral reefs are also going to hold nooks and crannies where fish are going to go and hide. The trigger fish has the name because when spooked, they swim into a hole 
They pop up their dorsal fin and you can use your hand like a trigger to pull it down and pull them out. If you ever read Jeannie Clark's book, she has a whole section on that. And my daughter's not into that book yet. She thinks it smells bad. It's a very old book. Coral reefs are also going to slice your monofilament and your fly line. So be careful. You need to be prepared when you go to fish these spots. Culverts. When you're fishing mountain streams, you're usually going to have a deep hole underneath the culvert where water goes underneath a small road and pipes drop in. Great spot for holding fish. You've got oxygenated water. You've got deeper water where water is dropped out of those and carved out a big hole. Now, TU and Orvis have been trying to get rid of a lot of culverts to make stream improvements because fish cannot migrate upstream to jump up and over these culverts. So there are ways to make them a little more fish habitat friendly. You find a culvert, you're going to find fish, especially out west where you've got irrigation culverts meeting up with rivers. And fish will swim up those into those narrow little channels where grasshoppers and ants are falling in all day long with overhanging grasses and shade and cut banks. Cushions in front of rocks. I mentioned that already. There's that little cushion where water goes around a rock and makes a pocket of soft water in front where fish can hang out and not burn energy and wait for food to come to it. It's not the safest spot for protection, but it's a good spot to find food and it's a good spot not to burn calories. Cuts and grooves on the bottom of the streams. We talk about the shad run. Well, those shad are following structure up the river. They're following the grooves and deep channels in that water because the water is slowest at the bottom. There's protection in there. They don't have to worry about being chased by dolphins downriver or big blue cats upriver and stripers if they can get down in these cracks and swim through them. Something you're not often going to see because it's deep down, but there are structures in the substrate where water has carved it out and fish can go along there. Now, if you ever fish the Harper's Ferry stretch in the Shenandoah and Potomac where they meet, there are horizontal and 30-degree angle bars that go across the water that have cut through time with erosion. And you're usually going to find fish on these. They're shelves, these long diagonal pieces of rock. And water's going to be fast along them, and it's going to manipulate the current. It's going to bring the water in. It's going to hit that bar, and then it's going to move around it or downstream, and the current's going to change. But each one of these bars should have fish on the other side of them and in the deep water in front of them. They are notoriously good at scraping your shins when you're wet waiting. Debris flows. So when rocks fall in a landslide... They're going to enter a stream at random. When floods deposit rocks, you're going to have going downstream a big rock, then a small rock below that, and then smaller rocks still around them. The difference between debris flow and flood has a different organization of rocks. A debris flow is just gravitational dropping of rocks and sediment into a stream that creates an ununiform random pile of rocks that fish can hang out around that crayfish will be under that caddisflies will be hiding under and mayflies and whatever else it's a great structure for micro and macro invertebrates to set up home you will find fish there and that's the kind of work i was studying in silverton was paleohydrologic debris flows from thousands of years ago and you'll notice them as just a random assortment of rocks that look like they were just dumped there by Mother Nature versus things that tumble downstream and as the current drops them, they organize themselves in a certain chronologically based on the size and when they got dropped in. Just look next time you see a flood and you'll see what I'm talking about. Docks, man. I grew up fishing docks. Either on docks or throwing flies at them. When we're fishing on docks, you have to tiptoe on the dock. I make everyone walk super quietly because the fish that are underneath them can hear you. Why are they underneath the dock? Birds and otters can't get them. There's shade under there. Docks always have spider webs on them. That's where midges are going to fly into and bounce off. That's where your dragonflies are going to crawl out of. If you've got wooden structures in the water, critters are going to congregate around there. 
You're going to get freshwater hydras and jellyfish. You'll get freshwater corals or bryozoans. Anything that can stick to that wood is going to attract something else, which is going to attract something bigger and then bigger still. I love fishing docks. And you got to throw sidearm. Either skip your fly and make it bounce under or get that one good cast underneath. More often than not, you can throw it right off the front of the dock, make it splat right in or bounce off the wood. And a fish will hear that because it's kind of static and quiet under the dock. They'll come out and eat it. I love fishing docks. Just remember that docks have lots of wood that are falling apart and your leader in line will get caught in those and it will mess up your flying line. There are splinters and chunks all over those docks. And docks have different heights. So if it's high tide, you might have less space versus low tide if you're out in a tidal section. And John Odenkirk has found snakeheads that will hang out by the same dock year after year, day after day. Docks are home to large fish. Drop-offs and ledges. I mentioned up at Harper's Ferry, all those drop-offs and ledges. Deeper water, cooler water. Place where you can hang out, where you're not going to get eaten by something from above, and food's going to come over a ledge and drop down to you. So when you're fishing with a streamer, you can strip, strip, and then just let it drop down. And then start stripping again. Make that fly manipulate and dance like it just came over at is disoriented and is an easy meal. This is when you're going to need your heavier nymphs, maybe some sinking lines. I'm still carrying sinking tips in the rod vault in the boat this time of year because there might be a deep drop off that we're trying to fish with a clouser and a snow white damsel behind. And we're still fishing this kind of lighter blue. Yeah, this one's gotten destroyed. This lighter blue bucktail that I showed you in the video. And I tied up for lifeguard Simon at the pool. I don't know, almost a dozen or so of these blue and white ones and some nice soft chartreuse and white ones for the summer. He's going striper fishing down on the northern neck. Lots of structure down there. A lot of docks. A lot of docks. So I like ledges. I like drop-offs. Fish can go up into the shallow water, eat, come back. They can hang out there, rest. For whatever reason, they're in there. They're susceptible to being caught by your fly. Now, around here, we've got a lot of duck blinds. There's a lot of duck hunting in northern Virginia. You wouldn't know that unless you get out on these bodies of water. Again, a fantastic place for snakes to hang out. So do not hook or go onto one of these without making a lot of noise. The duck blinds are covered in bamboo, and uh, sort of tarp material, and grasses, all sorts of things that attract birds and fish. A lot of them are falling apart. So they got the structure of a dock, but with all sorts of crap hanging off of them, that's going to attract fish. They're going to be near the pylons holding it up. They're going to be near the ladders for the dogs to get in. They're going to be hanging out by duck blinds. And this time of year, no one's duck hunting, so I don't have to worry about going up near one and getting shot. And there's some very nice duck blinds out here, and then there's some run-down ones. There are some that you wouldn't even know they're duck blinds anymore. They're just spots where cormorants can stand and poop. Now, when cormorants stand and poop, they drop their fertilizer in the water. And what does that do? That makes the plants grow. And that goes back to the people in the Keys that were cutting up the sand and mangrove grasses with their outboards. And some group, like University of Miami, went in and staked out along these cuts to see where they were and to come back to them to monitor if they were growing. Well, the cormorant started sitting on all these posts and started pooping in the water and that poop dropped down a foot or two, started fertilizing the ground, and the substrate, and the grasses started growing. So you find places like that, you're probably going to find something else hanging out that likes bird poop. Fish will eat bird poop. I know it's gross, but how many times have you hocked the loogie in the water and fish have eaten it? Fish just, they eat whatever. You could probably make a loogie fly and catch a fish or a bird poo fly and catch a fish. That's it for duck blinds. Let's talk about the edges of SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation. We were out the other day throwing eight weights with scorpion bugs and gutless frogs. And I was putting my clients casting a foot off of the edge. So the water's probably 15 to 20 feet deep, but there's a wall of aquatic vegetation and that's the furthest it's grown out at that day into the water. And the fish are sticking their heads out of there all up and down it 
waiting for something to swim by. There are damselflies crawling all through it, the nymphs. There's damselflies and dragonflies and butterflies on top. So fish are going to be looking up, eating things on top. That's where you throw your weedless frog. But in front of it is where you've got a vertical wall of holes where things can be sticking their heads out. And we caught the biggest bass of the day right along there. Not along the shoreline, but right along 70 feet from shore in deep water on the edge of the SAV. It's a great place to ambush prey. It's cooler. It's got shade. And if you were just to pick up a handful of all that LOD and hydrilla and milfoil, it should be crawling with scuds, water scorpions, damselfly nymphs, midge larva. It is a wealth of macroinvertebrates. And that's what the little fish they're eating, the big fish that they're eating them too. And the big fish are eating the little fish that are eating the little stuff. Now, fencing. We've got fencing all around here to keep geese out. So I don't want to fish the vertical fencing going along shore. But there are places like Four Mile Run that have the stream bank made out of fence. And that gives the rocks underneath a little bit of cover for all the little fish to hang out in. So then the big fish will go along that and look to suck things out. It's an awful place to snag your hooks on. You will see many a lure snagged on the fencing down there by the Route 1 bridge. But you might find fencing that's put in there for bank stabilization. There are chunks of fences that wash in. And I'm not talking just wire fences. You go up and down the Potomac, you will find chunks of wooden fences. There are chunks of docks. There are doors, blue barrels. The amount of stuff that washes down that river is bizarre. And then it gets out to sea eventually, and that's where you can find your open water, your pelagic fish like mahi-mahi and dolphin. You find that floating flotsam structure out in the open, you're going to find fish. Now, I've never fished out on one of those, but I know about it because I've read things. Pat Cohen said somebody caught a dolphin in the Pacific offshore in blue water with his Big Ben rat. Don't know if rat was on the structure and got loose, but fish will eat anything, anywhere, for no apparent reason. Someone found structure, they threw Big Ben, they caught a fish. It's pretty cool. So fences, metal, they're going to snag your flies. They're not easy to walk on. You definitely have to have cleated boots if they're at an angle because your cleats will catch them and you won't slide all the way down. There's lots of pieces sticking out for your fly line to get caught, so be very careful. This is another type of structure you may encounter that you may not have thought would hold fish. Flood debris. I mentioned all that stuff that washes down from the Potomac. Things wash down and will wash into a spot and make a giant pile in and out of the water of debris. Sticks, basketballs, shoes, hopefully no bodies. Uh, I found, like I said, doors, and you'll find barrels and clothing and lawn chairs. Whatever washes down will get caught in these and it makes a great pile for fish to hang in, out, and around, and for organisms to live on and around. Look for flood debris. Be careful of snakes. Hopefully, you don't find a body. After watching Stand By Me as a kid, I'm always worried I'm going to come across a bloated body sticking on one of those. And apparently, on Tuesday of this week, they found a skull in Roach's Run by the airport. I thought about doing some kind of Hamlet joke on the TPFR forum today, but Figure that would be in poor taste. That's a new one. A skull. Don't know if it had meat on hair on it or if it was just a bear skull or not, but uh, a human skull, bear, B-A-R-E, not B-E-A-R. Got no bears in Arlington that we know of. So that's flood debris. I love me a gravel bar. Gravel bars have lots of small textures on them, which will break up the current, and fish can hang out around that. As the current bumps off of those, either it can slow the water down or it can speed it up or it just creates current that's going to deliver food to them. We're finding a gravel bar right now that about 18 inches underwater is holding some nice largemouth. We're in the 6 to 10 inch range deep. It's holding bluegill. And I can go there with my clients and say, two feet to the right of that gravel bar, drop your fly down drag it to the left a foot or two, and that worm's going to be right on the edge of that structure, that mound of gravel, and a fish will be there. It doesn't really give the fish protection from above. It's just a physical object that they're attracted to because it's there. 
horizontal logs versus vertical logs. So if a log is going up and downstream, water is going to go over it and it's going to be fast. Unless there's branches and other objects sticking out from it or it's caught something. You want to look for the horizontal perpendicular logs and log jams in the water. Those are the ones that might trap sediment up front and make a deep eddy and hole behind it. There might be holes in the tree that fish can hang out in. You want to find the one that's going to break up the current and produce soft water downstream and to the side. That is one of the main things we're fishing in tidal creeks right now is those awkwardly placed logs and trees that have washed in, have become one with the stream bottom, and are changing the current direction, making deeper water, and just attracting all sorts of life. Jetties. If you fish the salt, jetties should be your jam. I used to fish jetties in my 20s going out to the bay at night till all hours, fish till sunrise. Jetties, giant boulders that have lots of places for little crabs to hang out and little fish to hang out and whatever else, chitons and other crustacea, who knows what could be hanging around a jetty. But wind and current will bring small bait fish there and then the large fish can congregate them and ambush them. Jetties are a fantastic structure. You can fish the upstream, up current, or down current side. You have different elevations at different tides. Luckily, the top of the jetty is flat and was built for walking on and not awkward angles. You always have to be safe walking on jetties because they're always wet and they're slick because the algae loves to grow on them. Jetties are always places fish will hang out at. And I used to love fishing jetties out on the bay and don't have time for it anymore. It's just not part of the life anymore. But when I do find a jetty, when I'm on a fishing trip, I go for it. A lot of the ones in Oahu I was fishing. Those were fun days. That was a long time ago podcast, right? That was that was 2010, November. It's a long time ago. Lily pads. Everyone loves to fish lily pads. It's where largemouth bass hang out. There are small lily pads and there's big ones. We don't got the big Amazonian ones here, but we got some the size of trash can lids up and down the Potomac. Shade and a place for fish to hang out. Nothing can see them from above. It's hard to see them from our angle. But you can drop a weedless fly, a worm fly, a frog fly on top of that, pull it off, let it sink, and start stripping and twitching your rod. Bring that fly to life. There should be a fish. You're going to get snagged in lily pads. The spatter dock here is not forgiving. If you hook spatter dock, you either got to break your fly off or go after it. There's no popping it out. That stuff is crazy fibrous. The fish are going to pull you in there and probably wrap you around something. So you're going to have to be fishing a heavy leader, preferably a short, taut one. I think we call those the goat rope from George Daniel. You need to muscle the fish out. I love fishing lily pads. I wish we had more lily pads to fish. When you see lily pads, you should think fish structure, fish habitat. That's where they're going to be. And on top of the spatter dock here, we got spatter dock beetles. You remember me talking about those in the snakehead tournament where you'd go over them and the boat would fill with spatter dock beetles and they'd be so thick. Spatter dock beetles would have spatter dock beetles on top of them. And those fall in the water and fish eat them. But bugs have to crawl up all these aquatic plants to emerge, break their skin and fly off. So you just find fish. If they're not under them, they're going to be around them. Log jams. That's kind of redundant from earlier. Log jams always hold fish. That's where you always look for your big, nasty, mean brown trout. That's where you're going to look for steelhead hanging out, taking a break. That's where you're going to find Mr. Big Largemouth. My daughter and I took the boat up a creek until we couldn't go anymore two Fridays ago, and there was a log jam, and I threw my popper with the worm, and a small bass grabbed the worm, and then I hooked it, set the hook, fights on. A bass five, six times bigger comes out from the depths of that was probably chasing my bass, but it looked like it was trying to eat the popper on top too, thinking that that bass was maybe chasing the popper. Either way, there was a bass swimming around in the melee for a good couple of seconds. I was hoping to get both of them hooked. But that proves to me, again, reinforces that big fish are going to be down in the depths of these nasty snags where things can't get to them. Unless you're going to go noodling for catfish, most things aren't going in there trying to get them out. Logs bolted into the substrate. That's a trout unlimited thing. You'll find telephone poles and trees that are bolted in at specific angles to redirect the current 
to create habitat and prevent erosion. You are always going to find fish around those. They're angled like those little things at the bottom of a pinball machine. That little angle that directs the pinball down, it's the same angle that that water's going around it. There's a name for that, that thing. Don't know it. Not a pinball guy. Let's talk about mangrove roots. Now, mangroves are the nursery of the little fish. It's where all the little critters hide out for structure to be safe from predators. Now, the water is always going to be clearer amongst the mangroves because of the filter-feeding organisms on them. So they can see better. They can see your fly, but they're always going to go into the mangrove and break you off. And remember, the mangrove is sort of the southern part of the hemisphere, and in the northern part of the hemisphere, that ecosystem is replaced by the salt marsh. Not as much structure, but lots of places to hide. Mangroves are going to have barnacles on them that are going to break you off. There's going to be shells of things on them that are going to cut you. And it's usually pretty stinky around mangroves, so you want to avoid walking around them. You'll get cut. You're just going to get stinky. Mangroves, I want to go fish mangroves in, in Florida. I want to do Everglades. I want to do snook, baby tarpon, whatever else is back in there. I want to take a month off and just take my boat and my canoe or kayak down there and just fish the mangroves when I win the lottery. I mentioned outboards will cut the grasses up in the keys. Well, up here right now, they're cutting up all these aquatic vegetation, most of it which is introduced, so I have no qualms about going across it with my outboard and cutting it up. You find these places that have been cut in this thick weeds right now, they may be three, four feet deep, depending on the size of the outboard. You're going to find fish hanging out in the center of those. When they're scared, they dart back into the SAV. If you can find a big open spot, you can drop a popper or a clouser in there. And those fish are not going to hesitate to chase them. Client Alex and I were out about five years ago when he was probably still in high school. He's graduated now and he's becoming a doctor. So it was a while ago. We were rowing out. We got stuck in the weeds, and we found this open spot, bigger than the boat. There are probably seven or eight largemouth just in this open spot. It was the one open spot where they can chase food and then dart off in a second to go hide. Probably hooked three or four largemouth in there from one to two pounds each in the same spot in that open cut section. And then when they did get spooked, they would dart off. And then you give them a couple minutes, they'd come back in. It was awesome. We caught a bunch of fish there. So when I'm with my clients, I say, look for those bald spots. Look for an opening in the SAV where you can just drop a fly in and see if something's going to come out and grab it. Overhanging branches, that's just kind of a given. Any place that inchworms are going to drop in, beetles and ants are going to fall off, shade producing, predatory prevention structure overhanging trees i love the tidal basin in dc you've got cherry trees all along it along the shenandoah you've got all those trees overhanging with shade you throw a scorpion bug along that shade and dead drift it with the current you're probably going to catch a nice small mouth burke lake down the street all these trees are falling in we had that derecho a couple years ago it blew tons of trees in the rivers and lakes here made great structure i love overhanging branches you know the fishy spots because that's where all the monofilament and all the lures and bobbers are going to be hanging. If there's overhanging branches with structure, again, you find the litter, you find the good fishing spots. Unless you're going to walk for it. If you walk, you won't find it. Pipes. Fish don't often hide inside a pipe because the gradient's too fast in there. It may be corrugated to break up the current inside but for the most part, that water is too fast for a fish to hold. So they might be on the outside of the pipe where water is bringing current and food to them. Or they might be on the upstream side of the pipe where water is getting sucked towards it and they can eat the fish. Same thing with tunnels. Now you might have just random pipes that are not made for water to flow through. They could have ended up there. When I was a kid, there was a PVC pipe sticking out of the shore. Don't know what it was there for, but there was always a catfish in it. Fish will back into things and hang out and hide if they feel comfortable. Pipes are one of those. They wash in from construction sites and from gutters and from who knows where. It might not be an intentionally built pipe to transfer water from one place to another. Now, Mark up at 
the trestle pool lodge has got some small culvert pipes that connect the marsh and beaver ponds in his backyard to the salmon river and if the water's high enough steelhead will end up in the beaver ponds in his backyard and they go through those pipes it's crazy absolutely crazy steelhead end up in beaver ponds now plunge pools when i'm trout fishing i love me the plunge pool when i'm out in colorado where we were supposed to be this week but it fell through i might go out for a week in september because i've had no adventure this summer i might just go sleep in my car next week just to get outside and, or sleep in the backyard it's been kind of a adventureless summer there hasn't been any i haven't been dirty i haven't been camping i haven't slept on the ground I haven't been chased by any crazy animals. I need adventure. Anyway, plunge pool. So when out west, I'm fishing usually a five or six weight with uh, about an eight, nine foot leader and a bacon fly heavily weighted. I'm going to throw that bacon fly right where the plunge is. Deep, oxygenated, turbulent, tumbling water. Because if something's upstream and gets sucked down, that's where it's going to land. The big fish are hanging out there. They're under a waterfall. It's protected. It's deep. It's cool. It's oxygenated. You present a big fly in there, or if the water's slow on the sides of the plunge, you might be able to get something nice on a dry fly. And if you're fishing plunge pools, always fish from the bottom up. A, you get a hike downstream on the way back. B, you can hide below a plunge plunge pool to fish above you. C, they don't see you coming. There's probably more things, but I love plunge pools. Absolutely. One of my favorites here. There's not too many plunge pools. We're going to find maybe below. I don't know what you'd find it around here. Just below drop offs, just an elevation, some larger plunge pools from those horizontal bars on the Shenandoah. Not a lot where I'm fishing in the, the tidal area. There's always going to be fishing plunge pools. If there's not, it's because somebody took them out. And if they're too deep, Fish might not even be in there. Don't waste your time on something that's super deep because it might just be devoid of food at that depth. And that brings me to pocket water. I love pocket water. Pocket water around plunge pools with big riffly boulders and all that where I can just creep up and in a 10 square foot spot, I can have five or six different places to throw my fly. We don't have too much pocket water with clients unless we're fishing smallmouth upstream or fishing a small creek. But you can find pocket water and present a fly, and each one of those little pockets should have a fish hanging out and hiding in it. When I used to fish Big Hunting Creek all the time, pocket water, pocket water, pocket water. So I pulled out a trout that was about 18 inches once from Big Hunting Creek on my one weight on a bacon fly. Didn't know fish got that big in that tailwater, but it was in a plunge pool next to pocket water. And maybe I'm going to take my daughter up there this weekend. When we're off. I don't got clients on Sunday. I'm going to have to take her to teach her about plunge pools. What about pylons and telephone poles? We got a lot of that at urban waters. Those are the places the ospreys are going to nest on. You're going to have fish congregate around there. Ospreys are going to drop all sorts of crap in the water too. So fish might be looking up for that. Bugs and stuff might be hanging out on their nests. They also cast a shadow. If you've ever seen the pictures of National Geographic, you'll have a big tree and then lions all lined up in the shade. And then they'll move with that shade as the sun turns. I saw this at Bonnaroo once. All these people were kind of passed out in the shade of this giant oak tree and were moving with the shade. Four-mile run, there's a huge pylon in the middle of it. And you will watch all the fish in that shade. They're out in the open water, but it's cooler. And they can't be seen from above as well because the water's darker. And they will hang out specifically in that area because they're shade. Rip wraps another one of those man-made things where a bunch of large boulders are dumped in. You find it here in Northern Virginia around all the dams in the ponds and lakes. You'll find it on stream banks that are been manipulated by man-made, people-made, human-made objects. So Four Mile Run was destroyed at its natural form in 74 with Tropical Storm Agnes. So the Army Corps of Engineers went in and they widened it to absorb all the stream runoff. I think it went up to a, it went up 11 feet when we had that five inch rainstorm a couple weeks ago. It was pretty nuts how that place got altered. And the both shorelines are just riprap, just to stabilize the bank. And when you get close to that, you will see bluegill and minnows 
hiding in all those nooks and crannies, and then the large mouth just meandering, swimming along the outsides. They're along that structure because it provides protection on one side and it also holds food, and there are little shady spots where they can hang out. Riprap is always going to hive fish. You find riprap around the bases of bridges, dams, anywhere that people have gone in to prevent the water from eroding a structure. Shade in general, any kind of shade is going to hold fish. I don't know why I have that as a talking point, but shade is not really an object. It's just a lack of light from a piece of structure. Shipwrecks. We've got Mallows Bay across the river from here. There are shipwrecks sunk all over the oceans for scuba diving and for fish attraction and for attracting fish. Shipwrecks. It's an obvious one. Sunken Christmas trees. When I was a kid on Lake Audubon, Reston Association, back then it was ROA, Reston Homeowners Association, would take Christmas trees and bundle them up, tie cinder blocks to them, and sink them in the lake for structure. I wish more people did this with Christmas trees. I think Christmas trees are a huge waste of, of resources. I don't know because I'm a Jewish person. I never grew up with one. So I don't really don't see the point of cutting down a tree that you're going to have for a month and then throw away. And it's great that they chop them up and recycle them, but the fact they were all cut down in the first place is just, I don't get it. There should be more Christmas trees bundled and dropped in spots because all of those pine needles put together create lots of microhabitat for critters to hang out. All those little caddisflies will cut up those pieces of the dead needles and make nests out of them. It's a real good benefit. It not only slows the water down around it, but it creates hiding spots, and places where food can be grown by Mother Nature. Tree stumps are another great one. I love me a good tree stump along the shoreline. You've got all the mess of the root balls at all the different angles. But if you find any kind of flooded old lake where there's stumps or along the shoreline, you always see on fishing shows, they're always going to catch crappy around those tree stumps in winter with little crappy rods. Mentioned tunnels already, a big tunnel versus a small tunnel. The smaller the tunnel, the faster the water is going to be going through it. The wider the tunnel, probably the slower. There's more water. It's not being concentrated like wind through city streets. And we fish tunnels a lot around here. Fish hang out under huge overpass tunnels because they're shade. They can corral bait against the sides and eat them. Fish will be in front of the tunnels eating whatever gets sucked towards it. Fish will be downstream from the tunnel eating whatever gets sucked through or is living around the slack water on the outside of the tunnel below it. If it's a non-moving body of water, you're still going to find fish hanging out on either side of those tunnels. Find tunnels, find fish. Turtle habitats. People will take logs and stumps or boards, whatever they can that will float, and they might chain it to shore or anchor it to the bottom and make turtle habitats. It's a great place to find fish because it provides shade and natural habitat. And those logs are probably going to have flatworms on them, maybe leeches. They're going to have snails. They might have scuds on them, dragonflies, whatever. I love undercut banks. And of course, you got to be quiet approaching undercut banks because fish can feel you coming. Undercut banks are going to have slower water along the edges of the stream or lake. It's where branches are going to be overhanging Food from above is going to fall in. Food from upstream is going to be directed by the current there. Fish can dart out and grab it and swim back at their leisure. They can hide under that and not be detected by anything. A lot of the time, we spook bass when we're shore fishing because they're right under our toes. Undercut banks, trout will do the same thing. See where that trout or that bass darted out from? Make a mental note. Come back in an hour or two. That fish will be there again. There's a reason the same fish get caught in the same spots over and over again. Because they have that home, that hiding spot, that safe place. And we take advantage of that and pull them out. I love fish in walls. Bait fish can get corralled along walls. Walls are a place where fish can back up to. Think of the tidal basin walls. They can back up to that knowing that the otters can't attack them. That birds aren't going to dive bomb them. I walk along that watery wall, and I just slowly bounce my flies right along it. That's where the fish are going to be. 
It's one giant vertical structure. And it's covered in algae. It's covered in plants. Great place to fish. And last but not least are water striders. Water striders taste horrible, apparently, to fish. They're not like ants. Fish don't like to eat them. Though I fed my little bluegill some ants today, and they spit them out. I've got one fish in there that's just a head and little body. He's not doing too well. I'm going to have to release him back into Mother Nature. But he's not eating, so I thought throwing some bugs in there might give them some protein. And they all spit them out. Water striders, if they're thick enough, same with whirligig beetles, will produce a canopy over the water of shade that the fish can then hide under. There are often times where you can throw a small popping bug right into that. The water striders scatter. Fish are going to come up and eat it. Or you can drop a nymph through it, a worm, whatever. Fish will be hiding underneath it. They can eat it and then go back underneath the shade and be protected from above. You can't see the fish are under there, but you know they might be under there because it's structure. And that's the whole point of this podcast. There might be fish there, so don't overlook it. Now, some of the stranger structures I have caught fish around. Traffic cones. Fish will hang out in a traffic cone. They'll hang out in garbage cans. They hang out around scooters and bicycles. They hang out in shopping carts. You go to the Alamoana Canal in Oahu, those shopping carts are full of fish. I've caught fish near lawnmowers. I've caught fish near sunken ladders. Caught fish near sunken cars. I've caught fish near tires. There was once a dead duck floating in the tidal basin. And I said to myself, probably a fish underneath that. What the hell? And this was when I was product testing my Snallygaster. I chucked it right next to that dead duck, twitched it. Boom. I caught a nice 10 to 12 inch largemouth. I once saw a dead cow in the middle of a stream that got stuck and died. I have seen a picnic table in the middle of the Potomac River and caught fish near it. How a picnic table ended up on top of rocks, I don't know, but it was there. Once caught fish inside of the apartment guide dispenser that you find near the bus stop. That was in the water, and the door was open, and there were fish in it. You never know what fish might be around, but if it's in the water, you can almost guarantee it. Then you have to figure out how to get your fly there appropriately with the least amount of casts to get those fish to eat. And then you're going to have a good time. From the listeners, I want to know what is the weirdest thing you've caught a fish next to. Send me an email. Tag me in a picture. Please, also, when you go to iTunes, if you're listening there, they have changed the categories and there's no indexing right now. Please go to the wilderness section Or click on my podcast and give it some stars. That's not star singular. Stars plural. Rate it. I need to show my friends that I'm doing this and that people are listening to it. So please go to iTunes. Give it some stars. I thank you for downloading this podcast. This has been episode 230 something of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast in the 10th year. This episode again has been brought to you by Corkers footwear corkers.com thank you to producer jason for making this sound good and i'm gonna throw it to him now jason do your thing thank you for joining us for the fly fishing consultant podcast for more information or to contact rob please go to www.robsnowwhite.com This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.